here of God using pilgrims and strangers and foreigners and refugees as his instruments to bring reconciliation to a world that's divided. About 20 years ago, my wife and I returned from the mission field. We lived in Latin America. Uh, we were in Costa Rica studying Spanish. We moved to Peru for seven years, and we moved to Puerto Rico, and we were there for four years. And uh, we fell in love with the people in each of those countries, first of all. And secondly, we began to get a sense of what it's like to be an immigrant in another country. I remember walking across the central plaza of Chiclayo, the town where we lived. I felt like I was the tallest person in the whole town. In fact, some of the people there called me El Señor Dos Pisos, the person, the man of two floors. Uh, they also kidded me as El Señor Robafocos, the guy who steals light bulbs. And uh, anyway, I had to figure out how to get along and fit in and how to see myself in that culture. So now that immigrants are here, I have learned to begin to look at the world through their eyes a bit more. And um, yet at first, I realized that uh, I had almost forgotten after moving back here what it was like to be an immigrant until the Lord began to remind me. When we first got here, we started attending an English-speaking church. And within about a week, the pastor approached Kim and me and asked if we'd be willing to help plant a Hispanic church in our city. We live in Indianapolis. And right away we agreed because at that point we were just missing Latin America and our friends in those countries. And so for 17 years now, we've been actively involved working with pastoring, uh, teaching, hanging out with, doing cookouts, eating the food of some of peoples from 10 different countries of Latin America there in the greater Indianapolis area. And at first we were making friendships and kind of unaware of things that, that they were wrestling with until before long as people began to have trust in us and confidence in us, they began to share with us their concerns, their anxieties, their questions, their perspectives. And we began to discover that a lot of them, maybe 60 or 70 percent, were well, what the world would call out there illegals. They did not have documents. My first reaction was, well, go back to your country. Go back where you came from and get the right kind of documents to come here. But as I listened to their stories, I began to realize it's not that simple for many of them. I remember one time we were out walking through a parking lot of a housing uh, development not too far from our church. And um, there was a guy sitting in a car. It was getting kind of cold, maybe late October, early November. And he had a little baby in his arms. And I walked up and said, ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo le va? Hey, how's it going? How's things going for you? And he was surprised at first that a tall North American would speak Spanish. But after he became comfortable with me, he began to tell me his story. The little child he had in his arm, her name was Nicole. And it turned out that that morning, Nicole's mother, I'm not sure that, that Carlos was married with, his, with her mother. Uh, Amanda, though, was her name that Amanda had disappeared. She had just disappeared. And Carlos, who didn't speak English, didn't know how to get a hold of her. And so I got on the phone, made a few phone calls, and discovered that Amanda had been stopped for a turn signal that had been out, had been picked up and turned over to ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and was now in the custody some two or three counties away en route for deportation out of the country. So here was a little child, Nicole, less than a year old, and a father, Carlos, who didn't know how to respond, a family divided. And that just, that broke my heart. Since then, I've seen many situations like that, families that are divided. So it's, it's a very complex situation. Now, I don't want to talk specifically about politics because it's too complicated and there are no easy answers. And so I'm not going to convince you to vote one way or the other or to lean one way or the other on all of the, the twisted questions and conversations about immigrants per se. But um, I do want us to think about some basic principles that we can agree upon as we ask God, how should we respond? How should we feel about immigrants when they're here in our midst? Um, there are labels that get tossed out, and those labels sometimes hurt more than they help. And one of them is, for example, now the word evangelical has been used so broadly that uh, people just assume, oh, if you say you're an evangelical, you believe one thing or the other about immigrants. So I don't use that label, nor do I use the label liberal or conservative. And in fact, just the whole idea of fake news, stories that are made up that confuse the public, is a term that I avoid. 
And so what I'm praying for is that God will help us come to some perspectives as fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ and agree upon some things that we can agree upon without getting caught up in all of the debate that divides the world. And I'll tell you why a bit more. That's important to me in just a bit. But right now, what I want to do is tell you that Christ prayed for unity among his believers, among his disciples, in what we call the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. He prayed, may they be one, and he had a reason for praying that his believers would be one so that the world would believe in Jesus Christ. I'm very concerned that the world is confused about the gospel message because sometimes believers are not one in unity on some things that I think are very important to agree upon. And so what I want to do is just suggest four certainties about immigration without getting into the whole political and, uh, and, and, and polarizing debate about what to do regarding immigrants. And uh, then I want to suggest some ideas about ways that I think that God would have us respond. Are you aware that there are over 65 million people today in the world that live in countries where they weren't born? And about half of them are refugees. They were forced out of their homes, and the other half just left because they were looking for a better life. Now, I've hung out with a lot of immigrants over my life, and I can tell you one thing. People just don't pull up roots and leave their home and their family and their friends and their work on a whim. There are reasons, good reasons, why people leave their home and move to other countries. Um, global immigration has its historical roots, and interestingly, somewhere around the year 2000, maybe a year or two before, the flow of immigration switched from what it had been for over 500 years. Columbus discovered America, we know, in 1492. And up until the late 90s of the 1900s, just a few years ago, the flow of immigration was from the colonializing north going to the colonialized south going with soldiers and with people that would go and live there and exploiting the countries of, of their resources and sometimes even enslaving people and bringing them back to the, the colonializing north. And so the immigration flow for 500 years was going from the north to the south, from Europe and from the United States and Canada to Africa, Central America, South America, Asia, etc. But somewhere around the late 90s, that flow of immigration switched. It turned, and now there is a flood. You can see things on the internet. I found all kinds of videos of immigrants coming to the north, and they're doing it for a reason. People fleeing from Cuba over political turmoil, or Mexico, or Venezuela here in the American continent, or from Ethiopia and Sudan and Iraq and Syria and Libya. Uh, they're in North Africa and so forth, or in, or in Asia, or in the Middle East, and they're flowing into Europe and into North America in droves. And as is to be expected, there are reactions against that, very reasonable and understandable. But I ask myself, who are these people? Who are these people and why are they uprooting and changing countries and going to other places? One thing I'm convinced of, and I'm sure you are too, as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, is that God loves each person regardless of where they've come from and even what they've done. And even if they have documents or not, I'm sure that God can see that person's heart and know what their motivation is. I've heard a lot of different stories from immigrants as, they've gained, as I've gained their confidence and they've trusted me with their stories. And I can tell you each one of their stories is very different. And every time I hear them talk, my heart goes out to them. And I can almost see myself, feel myself walking in their shoes and wrestling with the issues that they're struggling with. Another thing I've realized as I've related to, document, uh, to undocumented immigrants is that these are my new neighbors. And in reality, just we need to be practical about this. They're here to stay. There are movements to try to what's called self-deport, make life so miserable for people that are here so that they finally just pull up stakes and leave. I can tell you from my conversations with many immigrants, they're going to figure out any way they can not to go back from where they fled, and they're here to stay. I can tell you that many of these immigrants have been here since the mid-80s or the 90s. They've met their, 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 their spouse or their partner. They've had children. These children have been born here. These children are North America, or if they brought children at a very young age, at the age of one or two, like little Nicole that I talked about at the beginning, uh, those children now are more North American. 
In fact, I'm sure you know the children of immigrants, many of them perhaps that you're not aware, that don't have documents. They're caught in this bind because their parents came here without documents and they also came at an early age. They were brought here maybe in their parents' arms. And so they're here to stay. And these parents, as I talk to them, as I talk to them about what their hopes are for the future, they say, well, you know, when I first came to America, I was imagining I was going to be here for a few years, make some money, maybe get a good education, then go back and bless my people, work in my country, and, and help share what God's blessed me with, with people all around me. But there's kind of a wistfulness as they're talking to me because the reality is they know that they're probably never going to return to what was once their homeland. Even from Puerto Rico, they're U.S. citizens. We lived there for four years. Every time we would fly back into the airport in, in Puerto Rico, everybody would applaud. They would applaud that they were back home on Puerto Rican soil. They love their island, but they're scattered all over North America and around the world, and the likelihood that they'll go back to Puerto Rico is very slim. And so as I listen to these people, realize that God loves each person, realize that they're here to stay, my judgmental attitudes begin to shift and change. And at the same time, God drew me to the scriptures. And I began to study about pilgrims and about immigrants and about foreigners and about widows and about people that are marginalized and are left alone in this world. So that's certainty number one. Certainty number one, that immigration is out of control. We've got to admit it. It's just out of control. And I don't have answers for it. But it's a reality that we've got to recognize. There's a second certainty, and that is that the nations are coming to America. Now, they're coming to Europe too, but, and it's a similar story, but let's think about America. We have here in America, as a result, a growing ethnic diversity, both globally all around the world in, North, in the Northern Hemisphere, but also here in the States and in Canada. And as a result, the minority groups are growing. Or at one point, the minority groups altogether composed at best maybe 20% of the North American population. They've now edged up to 35%. African American, maybe around 13% of the North American population. The Hispanic peoples of all of the some 20 countries of Spanish-speaking countries, up somewhere around 17% of the population. And because the birth rate in the Hispanic population is greater, that population is growing every year. In fact, it's projected that somewhere around the year 2050, so we're talking basically, what, 33, 34 years from now, instead of the Anglo white population being the majority population, that percentage will drop below currently what is 65% down to below 50%. We'll still be the largest people group in North America, but will not be a majority population. It'll be one more minority population in a country filled with minority groups. And as a result, the majority of population is shrinking, and that population, many people in that population are feeling threatened. And we're hearing and seeing reactions of all kinds because of how people are reacting to these uh, trends. So globalization, which is what we call this movement of peoples, this easy um, movement from one country to another. You get on a plane, you go somewhere, you find a multiple, multiplicity of ways to communicate with each other. You've got exchange in markets and so forth. It's causing the world to be brought closer together but yet at the same time, we're being pushed farther apart even as we find ourselves living closer to each other. And as I've been thinking about all of these developments, I've asked myself, how had I missed it for so long? Here, Kim and I, my wife and I, had lived in Latin America for 12 plus years, had fallen in love with people from a variety of Latin American countries, and then we came back, and you know, because we're shaped by our own personal childhood experiences and our friendships and our family and our culture, we end up developing blinders on our eyes of what we see. We look at things that are kind of not peripheral, but things that are right in the center of our field of vision, and, and we look at things close at hand, and we don't pay as much attention to things far away. You know, God doesn't do that. Uh, Paul says in one place we see through a glass darkly, but someday we'll see face to face, and we'll see the world as God sees the world. God sees every person on the face of this earth as though they're right there in front of him and he cares deeply about each one. And he wants us to capture that same kind of vision for peoples in all kinds of circumstances. And so here we were, a returning missionary family from Latin America, and my community now had immigrants all around us. And I wasn't seeing them. I had kind of 
snapped back and reverted to my majority culture views and biases and blinders, and I wasn't seeing people all around me that Christ loved and died for. And so, number one, certainty one, immigration is out of control. That's a certainty I think we can all agree upon. Number two, the nations are coming to America. I think we all agree with that. That's a concern. And there's a third certainty that I want to propose and encourage you to think about together with me. It's very simply that God has a plan. I believe as a God-fearer, as someone who believes in a God who cares and is an omniscient God and is an all-powerful God, I believe that God either through His intention is either bringing about circumstances or at least permitting them to happen. And I believe that that also applies to immigration. Now, here's what brings me to the scripture, because we're thinking about how the scriptures can orient us in terms of our view and our attitudes regarding how to react to immigrants and how to respond. I believe that the scriptures, in addition to studying particular verses of the Bible and drilling down and understanding a specific text and doing what we call exegeting a passage, taking apart the component parts of the verbs and the nouns and understanding their meaning, I believe that that's a very fruitful way of studying the scripture, but at the same time, it's very important and helpful to look at the trajectories that thread throughout all of Scripture. And there's one trajectory among a bunch of them that I have not been as alert to until just recently. And that is that God is moving us on a trajectory toward greater and greater diversity that's going to take us to heaven someday. Someday, we're going to be in a multicultural, multi-ethnic situation. And we're going to be multilingual too. And I'm going to show you why I believe that that's the case. And so there's this trajectory. But before I get into that uh, anymore, I want to talk about why diversity is such a key theme in the Scripture. And I think it goes back to the fall in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Because you remember the root of sin that, that infected Adam and Eve was essentially prompted by egotism, by the, the, the tendency, the choice to say, I am the center of my own world. I know best, I am better than anybody else around me. And then the community, the communal expression of egotism is ethnocentrism, is a people group thinking, oh, my people that look like me, my race, my language, my culture is the best. And then we tend to stand in judgment on peoples of all other cultures and ethnic backgrounds. And relationally or communally, that takes its expression all around the world and has for centuries in tribalism and when nations have formed in, in blatant, exaggerated nationalism that puts the nation above God and His kingdom. And as a result, there are broken relationships. We have the examples right from the beginning of Cain and Abel estranged from each other. Or you've got Babel and the scattering of the nations. And I could go through all kinds of instances of that happening. And so God developed a plan of salvation to reconcile the estranged word with a world with all of these diverse groups of people to himself and to themselves. He put in march a plan and he did that through calling to himself a people, the people of God. And he did this to rescue us, our salvation, and to restore us even here on earth, transformation, and to prepare us for citizenship in God's kingdom, but not something that we just need to say, oh, that's going to happen tomorrow. We need to begin to practice for God's kingdom citizenship today here on this earth. And so to do that, he called a people after his own heart in the Old Testament, Israel, and told them, I want you to be a blessing to the nations of the earth. And we see that thread through, through people of the Old Testament. We can give some illustrations of that. I'll do that real quickly here, but we won't spend a lot of time on each one. And then in the New Testament, a bunch of themes that emerge. Jesus Christ and His body, the church. And so, first of all, the solution is God chose to use refugees and pilgrims and immigrants and foreigners to confront us with our egotism and with our ethnocentrism. He's brought peoples here among us so that we wake up and realize we're not the center of the world and there are people that He loves just as much as He loves us. And uh, so this is an opportunity for us to, to allow God to work in our lives through the people that are among us. You've got Abraham, for example, in the Old Testament, the very first one that God called. He said, go from your country. He called Abraham to be a pilgrim, to leave his land and to go to another place. Take your people and your, your father's household to the land that I will show you. And then there's Joseph. Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. He spent a bunch of his life in Egypt. 
And then his brothers came for food. And as a result of Joseph's obedience, God used Joseph to be a blessing not only to his family, but also to the whole Egyptian people. Scriptures say, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of, Egypt, of his Egyptian master. And then Moses too. God came to Moses there in early, the early book of Exodus and said, now go and I'm sending you to Pharaoh back to, back to Egypt to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. There's Ruth. She was not an Israelite. She's a Moabite. But she married and decided that she would make her mother-in-law's people, her people. She said, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you will go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And as a result, God blessed Ruth, like Ruth by becoming a part of the lineage of King David and of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. What an incredible blessing. There's Nehemiah. Again, when Israel is estranged from their land, and uh, they're in Persia as prisoners. And God used Nehemiah to be a cupbearer to the king and to be a blessing and to get resources available and to go back and to help build the walls of Jerusalem and restore Jerusalem to its former glory. There's Esther, who God also used as the wife of the queen of, the, of Persia. And as a result, for the Jews, it was a time of blessing. You can read that story there. There's Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And there's Jesus' family. A bunch of examples. I'm just skipping over a whole bunch. There's a thread here of God using pilgrims and strangers and foreigners and refugees as his instruments to bring reconciliation to a world that's divided. And then there's Jesus' family. He himself had to go as a refugee to Egypt. The angel said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. And then we've got Pentecost, there where Peter preaches, and there are like 17 language groups that understood the message in their own language. 3,000 people came to Christ. We get to Antioch when there's more followers of Jesus in Antioch than in Jerusalem, until finally the church has got to say, we can't call these people Jewish followers of Jesus. We've got to call them something else. And the Christians were first called Christians at Antioch because they were from multiple nations. Paul talks about the mystery of the gospel. And that mystery is that Gentiles and Jews together walk along down the street together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We no longer find our first identity in our ethnic background, in our language, but we find our identity as members of the body of Christ and citizens of God's kingdom. Paul says, we are Christ ambassadors. And all this is from God. He's reconciled us to himself and he's given us both the message and the ministry of reconciliation. And the world has come to our doorsteps, giving us huge opportunities. We no longer have to get on a plane and fly down to Peru. I've got Peruvians going to our church and they have family, family members in Peru. We had a Spaniard come. I take students to Spain. We had a Spaniard come and attend our church and through that connection, I was able to meet his family in Madrid, Spain. The Lord has brought refugees and foreigners to our own shores as a huge opportunity to be a blessing to the world for Christ. The world has come to our doorsteps. The writer of Luke Acts says, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Well, it's our Lord's desire that we be instruments in his hands. Christ prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. He doesn't want us to wait until we get there around the white throne to be one in Christ of every nation and tribe and tongue. He wants his heaven to come to earth today through us as his ambassadors. What a great opportunity and a privilege because he wants us to be witnesses of all of the believers of diverse cultures. So this is our opportunity to share the good news of the gospel, the mystery, God's people from all the nations of the earth. So what are some practical ways that maybe we could begin to think about just for starter ideas so that we can be kingdom citizens and allow God to work through us to be ambassadors of this wonderful gospel of reconciliation? First, we can perhaps so seek out social venues where immigrants gather. Just notice where are the immigrants gathering in your community, down the street, here in Mar Marion perhaps, or Grant County, or in Indianapolis, or wherever you're living. When you go back home with your family, where do the, where do the immigrants gather? 
And then be aware of people around you when you're out shopping. Do you see people alone? Often immigrants find themselves without family and friends, especially on holidays. On holidays when everybody's gathering into their homes, a lot of these immigrants have left their families back home. Maybe you could invite somebody to your home to celebrate a holiday. Or you could welcome new neighbors to your neighborhood and uh, just tell them you're glad they're there. I mean, many times they're wondering, am I at home here? Is this going to be some place where I'm going to be welcomed? And uh, so, so God wants to use us as kingdom citizens in our communities. There are some ways that our church also can be more like God's kingdom. Our churches can partner with a nearby church of a totally different ethnic group. It's enriching. We think we're giving, but we're not. We're receiving much more than we're giving by far. So we can partner with that church in, in ways of reaching our community, identify needs in the community that we share together, and then reach out together. Or we could offer to tutor the children of newcomers at the schools. Can you imagine how intimidating it must be to be a parent that doesn't speak the language of the school system and have the kids bring home all this homework and maybe, maybe uh, assignments uh, on the internet and so forth? It must be terribly overwhelming. We can be tutors. You'll be their best hero, both for the parents and the kids. Or you could research national holidays of people from those immigrant communities and then offer to celebrate those holidays together. And as we're serving, as ambassadors of this ministry of reconciliation, let's just keep praying for immigrants because it's not easy. But God has chosen them and he loves them to reach the world for Christ and he invites us to partner with them and be witnesses of the good news, the mystery of the gospel with them.